How can you not love this amazing company? So many brilliantly published and developed games. Sure they died down a bit when they left the hardware business, but still, they have such an amazing set of IPs. There's just so many of them that sadly have been left dormant and what we really want to see is a sequel to well, pretty much anything. Now sure we recently got the amazing Sonic game and that awesome new Puyo Puyo game which by the way I'm pretty much obsessed with. But what about Streets of Rage? What about Jet Set Radio? Who's up for Vector Man? Uh, Alex Kidd anyone? <laughs> the list is endless. You gotta give it to companies like Nintendo, whether you remember the classic games or not, that company will make sure that you somehow remember these games even if you've never played them before. And you know what? Fair play to them. The same goes for us YouTube nostalgia injected channel owners too. <laughs> Bring up a game like this and before long everyone and their mother's hedgehog will be buying a complete in box graded copy of the game, boosting up the prices to ridiculous levels because the audience somehow feel nostalgic about a game that they never owned and in some cases never even played. Which is surely the case when it comes down to games like Rystar. Yep, this game didn't sell that well back in the day. In fact, it sold quite badly. I remember it being plastered all over my Sega magazines, but just like everyone else, even with the game's good scores, for whatever reason, it just didn't intrigue me enough to actually spend my pocket money on it. However, nowadays for us retro gaming whores, it's an absolute classic that stands shoulder to shoulder amongst the system's very best selling and rated games. So let's finally cut the nostalgia crap shall we? And look into exactly why Rystar is such a good game that deserves all of the praise that it eventually got. Because we're going to be looking into the game's development, its histories, its cameos and of course the game itself. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Come on, I love me some classic Sega. It was only a matter of time before I gave the complete history spotlight to this bad boy. Oh yes, for today's episode we're looking at the weird video game character that looks like a cross between the blue spiny mammal and that overweight star from the Care Bears cartoons of the 90s. Like I already said, he, um, I, I assume it's a he, has become a pretty big icon in the video game world. And even though Sega are definitely never going to make another Rystar game, as stated by the lead designer Akira Nishino, Will Rystar come back? No, probably not. Of course, as a game developer, I would love to see it happen. At the time of the original, I was thinking of a sequel. It got as far as a character design for that sequel, but it didn't happen for various reasons. Uh, we can all dream, right? But hold up, hold up. Rystar sequels that the fans would love and would probably sell pretty damn well, but are never going to happen. Oh no, oh no, oh no. I think we're in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves. So, let's go back to the beginning. Back in the day before Rystar the shooting star and even before Sonic the bloody hedgehog, Sega looking to take a piece of the fat plumber's success decided enough was enough. We need to get ourselves a brand new mascot that's going to go head to head with Mario and Co. Now I will one day create a complete history of Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm serious, I will do it one day. So for now, I'm not going to go into the full process of how his design changed significantly from concept to reality due to the friction caused between Sega of America and Sega of Japan. No. For this episode, all you need to know is that Sonic was not the first design that popped up. And to be fair, it wasn't Rystar either. To tackle everything red, Sega decided to hold a little internal competition to create a mascot that would show off the Mega Drive and get it onto the radar of kids worldwide. <laughs> no pressure. Well, several characters were put up to the task, pretty much all of which have never been seen by us retro loving fans. However, one of the designs was this. Not a hedgehog, not a star, a rabbit. The gimmick, <coughs> sorry, 
the ability that the new nameless mascot would actually have is focused on the ears. Apparently the small mammal would use its ears to grab and throw objects to defeat enemies. It's a pretty cool concept and you can see the early design choices here most definitely made their way to both Sonic the Hedgehog and Rystar. Now obviously this didn't happen and what we got instead was a mascot that was far more appealing for the newly released Black Beast that had such amazing speed and control it dropped the jaw of all who saw it. Obviously this was an amazing smart move for Sega. However, sadly, the rabbit concept never got any further than this simple drawing. So, after the world went batshit crazy for Sonic the Hedgehog during the Mega Drive's lifespan, in 1995 with the new Sega Saturn on the horizon, people started to lose interest in the 16-bit generation. And although we started seeing some incredibly impressive games on all systems at this point, Sega also decided to go batshit crazy themselves, not only by releasing a new add-on every 5 minutes, but also by greenlighting the revival of the rabbit for a system that was on its last legs, instead of doing what they should have done, and got the Sonic Ball rolling on a proper Sonic the Hedgehog game for the Sega Saturn. It's easy to see in hindsight what went wrong, but as a retro gamer nowadays, it's actually quite an awesome love story and actually reminds me of Walt Disney losing the rights to his rabbit creation and ended up creating the almighty Mickey Mouse. Now obviously this isn't what we got, but like I said, it's easy to see the inspiration. But going back ever so slightly before we got Rystar looking into old magazine scans and early development ROMs show that the character was actually changed up quite a bit. Firstly looking at the scans here which are taken by the awesome Rystar cluster website, you can see he wasn't actually a star. Who knows what this is? And obviously he wasn't called Rystar either, but instead Phil. Huh, makes sense. A few screenshots are also grabbed that show off a few slight variations to the final game, but more importantly, we do get a very blurry rough look at what Phil was gonna look like in the game. The only thing left over on the cartridge from the Phil days, however, is a couple of tiny sprites used in the corner of the game that when zoomed in, look like this. Now there are quite a few prototypes of this game lurking about, and honestly, I could go into every minute detail but that wouldn't be very interesting. Go check the previously mentioned website if you want to go find them out. But for the making of section of this video, there are a few changes found throughout that are definitely worth mentioning. Like for instance, the final three lines in memory for the ending sequence read, Caution, Rystar is not Volt. What's Volt I hear you ask? Well, it's believed by many to be yet another possible name for the yellow character that could have even outdated Phil, which may explain the lightning shoes he wears in the final version. But then again, that doesn't really explain the Sonic looking shoes that you can see in the Phil screenshots. Other than this, you've got a crazy amount of unused sprites, levels and sound effects, a few of which actually come from Sonic 3. And out of all of these prototypes, there is one that has a completely different title screen, giving the character a fourth, although probably not final name, Dexstar. Oh my god. What was Sega doing with this rabbit turned upside down, David Drehman's chin looking eventual star of a video game character that again, was released during the late days of the system's life? Well, I bet Sonic Team don't even have the answer to that one. Either way, the game was finally released in North America first on February 16th, 1995, followed by Japan, Europe and then Australia. And well, I think it's time we finally look at what they created. all those people that say Sonic is just hold right and jump when you stop running? Well, obviously that's bogus. Any decent player of the games will back this up. 
However, if you are one of these people, then I suggest checking out Rystar. Not only does it use the same engine as Sonic 1, but the lead guy, Akira Nishino, also worked on Sonic CD. And before even playing, you can surely see the similarities. But, the main difference with this game over the similar looking Sonic the Hedgehog games is that this is far more of a slower and at this point in gaming a far more interesting and fresh platformer. The story goes that this evil space pirate douche named Greedy from the Valdi system is using his mind control techniques to take over loads of planet leaders in an attempt to get them to obey him. Now this is where it gets a little different depending on which version you get. In the Japan release the inhabitants of planet Nier pray for a hero to stop this from happening and the prayers ended up reaching a star goddess who awakens one of her children who just so happens to be Rystar to save the day. Now in the English release, Rystar's dad gets kidnapped by Greedy, which gives Rystar all the encouragement he needs to save the day and his dad. I quite like that both versions have different stories myself, and due to playing the English one more, I'm going to say that that's my favourite out of the two, so we're just going to go with that one. Rystar is quite a simple to play game. Even with the Mega Drive's free button controller, there really is only two moves you need to use. You got jump and you got grab. Like I said, with only two main controls, it's pretty simple. But just like all good platformers, the amount of things you can do with those two actions is quite impressive. The team wanted to make it so that you could grab hold of everything you see which is why they modelled the design of Rystar on a small child. Because, you know, kids literally love to touch, or should I say feel, everything. And with that in mind, they pretty much nailed it. Sure, by today's standards you're really not grabbing much more than what you need to, but comparing this to other games at the time, it was quite unique. You can use your arms to pull yourself up lifts, ladders, spin on those little handles, defeat enemies, and heck, even grab hold of some enemies and use them to move on in the game. It's quite ingenious, one simple mechanic used again and again in a gorgeous looking world. And as this is not about the speed, but instead the chilled out exploring of it all, what you got is a game that, other than the look of it all, is actually nothing like the game it's always being compared to. Every level looks stunning in Rystar, and very different from the last. Rystar always looks and feels like it can interact with each one brilliantly, and overall, the game is just great fun to play. Look, even Rystar looks like he's enjoying himself. Well, in the Japanese version at least. In the English version, however, not so much. As usual, the game is available anywhere and everywhere, so if you don't want to pay the inflated original prices that just keeps getting higher and higher every time someone like me makes a Rystar video, then my suggestion is to just spend a quid or two on getting an emulated version, and in fact, the Steam release is a bloody good version of the game. Now as you may know, Rystar didn't just make its way on the Mega Drive at the arse end of its life, it also messed about on the Game Gear too, and this version is bloody fantastic. You know, for a Game Gear port of a Mega Drive game that is. Why would you ever choose this over the original? Well you wouldn't, but back in the day if you didn't own a Mega Drive, then the Game Gear version is a great port of an already brilliant game. There really isn't much else to say about this port, it's just a really good Game Gear game. Go play it if you really, really want more Rystar in your life. Otherwise, just pick this one up instead. So, what's next for Rystar? Well, nothing. Even though the original was a brilliant game with good reviews and a loyal fan base behind it, like I said, it came out way too late for both systems, and because of this, there was hardly any marketing for the game at all. And this is why I perhaps passed it up. I remember one of the very final Sega magazines I picked up did a feature of the Yellow Star on the front cover. But to fill up the rest of the ever decreasing pages of the Sega magazine, it spent a lot of time talking about the Sega Saturn, which was already out in Japan. As a young lad, it was hard to get excited for yet another platformer. Heck, that's all I've been playing on my Mega Drive bar a couple of releases up to this point. And although I do remember seeing Rystar in the shops, it wasn't long after that I got my PlayStation, leaving the world of Sega well behind. 
Now obviously poor old Rystar did in fact build up that cult fan base many many years later. And although, like I said, we are never going to get that awesome sequel that we so desire, that was apparently going to expand the Rystar universe with extra characters that use their legs, body and hair to perform special abilities, he has made the odd cameo. You got him popping up in Shenmue, you can see him in the intro for Sega Gaga, and of course another nice 3D model of Rystar can be seen in the downloadable track Egg Hanger for the original Sega All-Star Racing. And at the beginning of every track in its sequel, Sonic and All-Star Racing transformed. And it's all because of this originally forgotten Mega Drive classic. Rystar, it's taken a while, but you're finally here in the winner's circle of classic Sega titles. That original game is one of the most Mega Drive looking games ever made, apart from Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles of course. And if you ask me, no matter what console you collect for, this game is fully worth checking out. Which finally brings this complete history episode to a close. Now as usual when I end one of these videos spewing out my theories on the future of another forgotten Sega mascot, all I can hope for is that Sega continue to show off their brilliant history. Heck, it works for Sonic Mania and the crowd went wild for Shenmue 3, so you never know. I mean come on, Rystar uses the Sonic engine, so why not make a sequel? Look, whatever the Big Blue decide to do, let's all just hope that they continue to showcase this amazing character in future releases. Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video. It's the part of the video where I do my usual Patreon shout out with a special shout out going to Matthew Ritter, Ryan Burford, Phil Lowell, Z and A Chapman, Creamy Elephant, James Loveridge, Casey Garner, Blitz, Hedgy Ben, Hall, Taylor Armandson, Killer J, Takikawa, and of course Tiago Piera dos Santos Silva. If you want to be part of the list, get your name shouted out, get your name shown, see exclusive content, show your content on the Discord channel, see plenty of exclusives and loads of other bits and bobs, then you know what to do. Click the link that you see on the screen. Don't forget to subscribe, give it a thumbs up, thumbs down, put it on social media, do all of that stuff. But for now, this is DJ Slope signing out and hopefully I'll see you all next time.